Today we're going to take a look at some professional video monitors. Sorry, not the CRT types that all the retro gamers are drooling over, but the small LCD type. I have here 8.4 inch models from Panasonic, Ikigami, and Sony. The difference in size is interesting, especially considering the Panasonic one appears to have the most features. Let's try them out and then we'll take them apart and see what's similar or different inside them. First we've got here the Panasonic, it's a BT-LH900A. It can have battery mounts on the back there. I already pulled that off because I wanted to see what was going on under it. Uh, the controls are the separate part here that you can unscrew and reattach to the bottom or just remove completely and then remote control it through either the GPI or the serial port. Fairly nice compact design, it's got tripod type threads for mounting it in there. Let's turn it on, have a look at it. It's a 12 volt, standard 12 volt input. And we've got some bars connected on the other end of this cable. Like that. It's got a waveform monitor built in when you push the function button. That's pretty nice. And these are at preset uh, positions or when you wind this out, or when you pop that out, you can you can adjust them and then they go back to a, the preset position when you push the button back in. I think the light, when you have it out and have it adjusted away from the preset position, yeah, it has SDI, two SDI inputs, two composite inputs. And it's also got component RGB input. And yeah, that wave mod four monitor is quite good. There's a menu to configure everything. Put the waveform monitor on and off. Waveform function. Or GPI. I see. Waveform on off. Oh, you can make do HV delay. Very good. It also displays the input voltage on there, which is interesting. That's useful, I guess, if you're... Well, it's useful when you're running on battery because you can tell when the battery is going bad. Switch on the back there. So presumably, if it didn't have the controller connected, uh, it will just function and it will just be in its default position. You can set the input to auto select so that it will auto choose what input has got video connected to it. Yes, it just stays doing what it was doing before. Let's have a look inside here. The screws that hold the control panel on were captive. But that one there, it's little captive washer thing is clogged out for some reason. It's been a little bit beat up in the past. You can see that one of the posts has been pushed through and also that mount there hole had been snapped out, I glued it back on sort of with some super glue it seems to be holding so there's controls, those are encoders so they turn as much as you like and then little buttons with tack switches let's take a look at the Ikigami monitor so this one, it looks like this power supply would be removable easily but it's not, there's no access to it from the front so it's an AC input and it doesn't have automatic terminating on the loop outs like the other one does, the Panasonic monitor. And you can see on the Panasonic one, the out connector there is different. It'll be one that has a switch in it, so it turns off the terminator when you plug something into there. Whereas that's not the case on these, but these are nice proper 75 ohm connectors. A nice 75 ohm cable and plug. It has a fan which spins up briefly. There you go. There's no waveform monitors or other exciting things that I can see in this. And it has the same type of controls where 
you pull it out and you can adjust it. But these aren't encoders, they are just normal variable resistors. And then it goes back to the preset position when you put it in. Uh, you can save that, there's a whole bunch of presets that you can choose from there to and save. It has various markers. But there isn't thing, exciting things like waveform monitors that I have been able to find. The it can is possible to put batteries on there, but that just needs different internal configurations for that. You can choose the inputs of that. There's utility, I don't know what that does. It needs to just cycle through the inputs. You can go to independent colors, put on the markers, the underscan, monochrome. So this one has, it's got SDI and composite only, it doesn't have a component or RGB input. It has options for audio output, which would de-embed from the SDI presumably. That's interesting. Ah, I didn't talk about the model number, did we? It's an HLM910R. And what's really interesting about this is the serial number is 10. 10? Does that mean this is the 10th one they made? Or is this the 10th one from the E series? That's, I'm so surprised that that would be 10th. Doesn't really make sense, does it? What about this one then? It's another one of the same model. And that is 9. We've got consecutive serial number monitors. That's very interesting and surprising. And surprisingly low serial numbers. Not really sure what to make of that, but there you go. And then finally we've got this Sony monitor, which is doesn't have SDI. It's got RGB component. It's got S video, two composite inputs, parallel remote only, there's no serial remote on that. It has a 12 volt input. Interesting, it seems to be a Korean model. It's made in Korea and it's got Korean writing in a few places. So it's a LMD9020. And it has a battery mount on the back and 12 volt input. And this one came with a power supply that can go onto the the battery mount. But interestingly, it's got some blockers which prevent you from putting it on other... Because I tried putting it on the bracket of the Panasonic monitor and it won't fit because it's expecting something to go into those. So I think there's a trick there to prevent you from using this on other devices. Let's see, there's a release lever there. And that will slide on and just click into place like that and that then covers up the 12 volt input so you can't connect that at the same time a lot of relays click when you turn it on and it's got a fan that briefly spins up unfortunately this one's not in very good shape it has whatever this is wrong with it. And I was hoping today what we could do is see if we can change the panel from this for one of the others to see if that was the problem. But when I looked up the specs, this is a 640x480 panel, whereas the other two monitors are 1024768. We won't be able to change the panel. And that's pretty disappointing because that was going to be one of the points of this video was seeing if we could fix this or work out what problem was by swapping the panels but anyway we're going to take them apart anyway to have a look but yeah I'm not really sure what this means or how to resolve that uh, without getting another one that's in good condition or has a different fault or oh, maybe we can look in a service manual to see what's going on but it has all the same things aspect ratio markers blue only monochrome under scan sync selection and then just some knobs for setting the all right let's take this one apart we want to see what's in there let's start by looking inside the power supply it's got arrows pointing to screws so presumably those will be the ones you have to open to take it apart jis screws like always as you'd expect now is that enough or do you have to do these as well 
or even those maybe. I don't know, let's undo these ones and see what happens. Oh, there's a long screws. Oh, that's got a lot of stuff around the edges, as you'd expect, sort of switch mode with AC input, fuse, filtering, bin rush limiting, presumably. Maybe I just have that permanently in circuit. Then there's a rectifier, main capacitor, 450 volts, 150 microfarads, Nippon Chemicon, of course, no expense spared there. Now these output capacitors. That's a Sam Young. Those ones there are Panasonic's. Don't know what Sam Young is all about. But that's a, a part of an output filter there. Capacitors, inductor, capacitors. So there's a control I see there. There's feedback optocoupler. There's the main switching device, some sort of Bethel transistor. The transformer, output rectifier, capacitors. And some kind of IC there, what is that? LM340T7812 Okay, it's some little power supply. Dunno, why would it need a linear regulator on the output? I wonder if it's using that as some kind of reference with the... the object coupler. Weird. Anyway, there's some sort of filter going on there to catch the flyback from the transformer. Interesting. But I don't think that's what you came here for. You've got to want to look in the actual monitor. So let's get into that. Let's see what joys it brings. Now there's arrows pointing to some screws, so we'll do those first. I'll see I have taken apart one of the Ikigami ones already before this video. I couldn't help it. And it was quite surprising what was in there. So let's see how this compares. Oh, that peel off now. Telly lights. It's a board up there. And it will shine out that little slot thing. They've all got telly lights. So there's a board on the back where the connectors are. And then there's some filter, EMI filter thingies. Then there's this board which is in a shielded enclosure, which I guess that would be well that's the whole goes the whole way across. Some sort of power supply thing there. Okay, I'm not really sure what the next step is with this. Probably multiple ways you can go in from the back. Or this here looks like it takes off the front part. This was sold very cheaply because it was just in unknown condition, untested for, yeah, guessing what they were doing was hiding the fact that it didn't work. But it was quite cheap regardless. It's a bit disappointing that it doesn't work, but yeah, otherwise it would have been a lot more expensive, wouldn't it? Does something come off now? Oh, it's... Ripped. Yeah, it's ripping off that, which is some conductive tape for the EMI. Okay, I wonder if that means we've got to start from the back. It is a bit surprising. You think for the professional equipment, it will be a little bit easier to get access to the boards for servicing. Maybe these things are super reliable, so they hardly ever have to be opened up. Presumably this back panel is going to be loose. Oh yeah, there's lots of good loose stuff now. That approach of just undo all the screws and see what happens. Now I suppose we've got to take these off as well, so that that board gets left behind. There we go, it's coming all loose now. Okay, back comes off, leaves the two DC connectors. Okay, so the, the battery connector there is just power, ground, that's it. There's no other sensing or balancing things. I was just thinking, is that because you can only put the AC adapter here? But no, that doesn't make sense. Why would they use a battery connector? Okay, let's undo those. 
I suppose it doesn't really matter which way around they go because yeah just the inputs now that all this stuff was held up on that back panel and then the bottom panel that's just power supply stuff oh, there's pinouts listed there for things it's got there on this connector it's got digital 5 volts ground analog 5 volts band 5 volts ground 3.3 ground minus 5 8 volts this one here is 1212 12 ground ground this one here is 12 ground analog 5 minus 5 ground 3.3 ground digital 5 volts ground wondering what the next step is I think we've got to peel this tape stuff off unfortunately in order to get these boards to come out ah, you can see down there what we've uncovered is the wires going into the panel ah, it's really annoying the panel won't, won't be compatible really hoping that would that they would be compatible to help with some debugging of this I couldn't really think of what else what else to measure in here to determine what the problem is. It's just a corrupt picture and it's all high speed data, so it's not something you can easily work out what's going on once the signal's digitized. Oh, there's so many little voice suppression thingies. multiple presumably this will unclip Let's see any screws oh there's tape it's all taped together there's a different model of the sony monitor that looks very similar but it's the one it's one that has sdi input so presumably on that one they've used the 1024 by 768 screen for better representation of the hd video that you can get through the sdi connector yeah, it's a shame I didn't get hold of one of those yet. Maybe next time. Oh, look at that. Look at that. There's a one of those things in there. It's very strange looking because it's got a some sort of border around it. Ah, oh, so a fancier version can have stuff on there. Maybe that's what they do for the... SDI version maybe? Maybe it's just connected in. Now I'm gonna have to get one so we can find out, aren't I? Yes, that wasn't too bad for servicing, was it? I think if you knew what you were doing, you could this stuff could all stay on the back panel and you could take the side off, peel these tapes out of the way, and then this will just come down like that. And you can access everything you need. Anything below this is gonna be the panel. I'm wondering, should we take this board out and look on the back of it to see if there's anything interesting there? Probably won't be, and then we'll get this tray out, and we'll take a look at the panel. If we can get in that deeply. I don't know if we should try squeezing things about while it's turned on to see if the picture comes right. Might be something fun to do. Just in case it's a bad connection somewhere. It's a bit optimistic. There's a lot of wires. Uh, Oh, oopsies, gotta undo that. I wanna rip that out, do we? That's pretty much blank under there. Okay, we'll just take this off now. So this monitor... Oh, do I give it away or should we look later? It's got a lot less stuff in it than in the Ikigami monitor. Which is interesting, because I thought these would have pretty much the same amount of stuff in them, because what? why would it be different? Yeah, well there's the backlight driver, it's got quite a lot of wires going to it, and there's another fan there. Okay, so the wire that that little thingy goes to both fans, I thought it was a bit weird that the fan wire going through that was shared with another one, another wire, but it's another fan wire, so there you go. I think what we do now is we get this 
sheet out and then we can have a look at the back of the panel just for the lols and then we'll have a look at turning it on and see well putting it back into a state that we can turn it on while it's open and see if we can poke it about and see if that does anything interesting oh the panel comes out with this that's a little bit annoying because it means now I've got to undo these well at least that ground strap thing I thought that this metal plate would just lift off and leave the panel in there so that we could look at it from behind guess not at least most of the screws are the same there it's not what I wanted, I wanted to see the back of the panel there so we could look at the part numbers on it but that's not how it works is it you've got to undo it from here Oh, it's got weird screws mounting it. The there's a an unthreaded spot there, so that they don't go tight. So that's floating, more or less. Oh, this is gonna be difficult because there's the tape is on here as well. Oh, the tape. Do we unplug this? It went up to the telly light, there's the backlight, and there's the fan. We have to undo that. Oh, it's taped in from every direction. Everything's taped in. All I wanted to do was look at the part number. Just so we got a, a view of what the what the LCD part number is. The thing is this tape's not going to go back because it's getting ripped to get it off. Okay, I've got to undo the backlight cable now. Now, look at that, there we go, we can hinge it out. We've got an NEC panel there. NL6448BC2608D. There you go. I'll just take a few photos of these things and then we'll have a look at putting this stuff back together. Okay, we're going to put some of this back together and then see what happens next. I'm going to mount up this stuff. These ground straps. I uh, screwed the panel back in. The tapes don't, the, the EMI conductive tapes don't stick back down, which is not very good, they seem to not have sticky anymore. And this is going to be a bit of a wreck after this. I see, so that screw where it went through a slotted hole is that one is, is round. So you got to locate it with this one first. And then the other one is just take up the slack. I guess it's the same up here. And there's this one here, which is the round one now. Which means you should be able to do those ones up tight. And then the other ones will just fall into position. That was all that we had to undo. The do up on that layer, wasn't it? So we had to get the backlight connector back. And these real tiny connectors in this. And that one's done back up. I tried to pull out to get them the thing out, the panel out. Where did this go? Did this board hold any of those down? Did a couple. Seems to be more or less a one chip solution here with that thing. And whatever that does, little thing there. Etron Tech. Maybe that's a memory. That looks like an audio amplifier there. Seems like all the business comes in here. It says S video in, audio in. Oh, that's the controls. And it goes to that board. It might be digital lines for selecting the the source ah uh, yeah this one here with all the shielded wires that will be the actual video signals yes it seems to be it's got line 1, line 2, S, Y, S, C that's the S video then it's got the components and then this one with the twisted oh, it's power supplies oh yeah that comes off of that up the top there Okay, so that's all pretty straightforward. I was thinking, should we reattach this back panel to those two boards and then they'll be held securely so that we can power it up? It's 
got all this stuff going on here and then there's a thermal pad there to couple heat to this back panel uh, was that the way around it went? Presumably those are just a parallel so it doesn't matter. I think that these corner screws here would be a different colour so that you could differentiate what you need to do to undo the back versus taking these boards off. Like what it does in the Panasonic stuff with the red screws. Okay, so that folds out nicely. See this. Let's juice it up and give things a bit of a poke and see if that improves anything. Yeah, fortunately that stuff is a bit not attached anymore. Oh, there were more screws holding that in. Not many more, just that one. Okay, it went like that. In there. Guess so, yeah. Okay, well that... Yeah, okay. Whatever. Okay, so the, the fan thing is in there. Alright, we don't need to worry about that for now. Let's get this thing turned on and see what it does. Find my bars. This wire here. Hasn't changed at all. Well, did we expect it to? Not really. I'm going to try squeezing this board around a bit. See if that changed anything in okay, case so there's some sort of loose connection really we need to squeeze on the panel but now that's all put back together because it could be some sort of conductive bit around the edge of the panel that's messed up and we the panel connector it's not really changing anything who knows not really sure what the next step is with that could be some sort of corruption after it gets digitized Something on this is not doing its job. It looks like it affects the menu. Well, it, it definitely affects the menu as well. Beyond the signal, like analog to digital business. It doesn't seem to be as easy as just so sort of giving something a bit of a squeeze and bringing in a loose connection. Oh well, that's the Sony monitor. Oh, are we going biggest to smallest? Should we look in the Ikigami monitor first? Need to clean that off. I think that's pen. It's not on the screen because these have a clear um, shield thing in front of them, in front of the screen. Yeah, so this is a weird one. To get these open, you gotta undo this stuff. This isn't the one I opened before. Take the terminator off. There's one um, like whatever screw you call that that goes into plastic rather than the other ones and then there's a bunch of screws around the edge there's the regular M3s then we got some other M3s but countersunk all still JIS of course these ones are made in Japan unlike that Sony one which is made in Korea then there's these little ones which you need to go down to the JIS-1 screwdriver to undo those. There must be M2.5s maybe. And you see there are other screws there but they take the front off which is those ones as well and but nothing at the top for that so three screws you can get the front part off. Now this should lift out. Ooh, watch out for that. So now you can see that to get the power supply off, there's screws in from the back there. A little tiny fan with the connector there, or the cable, which is really difficult to undo. Now there are options here as well. There's a, a ruined cable connector there, which I don't know what that's meant for. And there's another board to board type header there, and then there's some studs. So there must be an option to have another board there that audio out stuff goes here and there's studs there Let's see what happens when we take these off so there's a plate not that there's a plate here that's holding this topmost board now i think this will come off when that connector there and gives out on us there we go 
Ah, okay, it's got a heat sinking thing to that. That huge guy there. Bit of stuff on the bottom side of this board. Another screw. There are thermal pads holding this board down to the plate as well. Oh, there's some kind of there's hand soldering there with lots of flux. Okay, so that's all power supply business going on there. The genom chip there. Oh, it's related to that expansion connector by the look of it. That's the one that goes through the main board. We've got an Altera Cyclone CPLD there and a Toshiba something or other. And then a whole bunch of power supply stuff. I don't know what that would do, that header there. That's quite a bit of stuff. And then come down to this board and you've got this huge other kind of CPU looking thing. And I already tried looking up the part number on that. It's Hitachi, including the PCB, so it seems like it's a module that you can buy. And when I searched that, it showed that this this big chip here is used in some other professional monitors. So it makes me think it's some sort of signal processing thing for video stuff. That's got RAM presumably. Some other chip there. More of that RAM stuff. It's quite hard to see what this says on it, but it seems to be YGT039A maybe. And when we pulled that off, we see we got now, we had an Altera Cyclone there, on on this board. And now on this lower board, we got two Altera Cyclone 2s. So it's more stuff. So it means the signal from this top board, which has the connectors on it, it seems like, seems like that Altera chip is related to this expansion connector. The direction of those tracks. I'm not really sure what the deal is with that. I don't know where it gets turned into digital. I guess that's what that Toshiba or that Genom chip does. But the signals from that top board which come through the header there. And down here there's a whole bunch of tracks that go through some buffers and then into this Cyclone 2. And there's a whole bunch of tracks coming out of that onto this header. Which is what pops up onto this board. It goes into there. And there's a header on the other side of that. So they come out of there down to this header. And then those tracks go through more buffers onto the other Cyclone 2. And then the output of that is going through another buffer. I think it's an LVDS driver. And then there's these, which are the wires going off to the panel. There's a lot of stuff. It goes through this and at least two CPLDs, maybe a third, on its way from the connectors to the panel. Seems a lot more than what it was doing in that Sony monitor. I'll insert a photo of the back of the panel so you can see the part number because I think we've taken this one apart enough for today. But yeah, I'd like to know what that is, but unfortunately I don't know how to work out what that is. There's quite a lot of LEDs on this board. There's a row of them up there. There, there, there as well. Showing you the status of different power supplies. And there's also a whole bunch of configuration there's jumpers in a couple of places, and then there's dip switches there, and there's various notes in the silk screen about it. It says there EL311 and EL312 is for choosing whether it's a 5 volt LCD or 3.3 volt LCD. I'm not sure where those EL things are. Those two LEDs there tell you whether it's either NIMH or NICAD, so that will be when you have batteries mounted in. In, instead of the power, well, like a battery mount instead of the power supply that you specify what type of battery it's going to be used with. Okay, let's take a quick look inside the Panasonic monitor before we run out of time. We'll just push this to the side. Right, time for Panasonic monitor. I've not opened this before, so that will be exciting. It's got these are just generic mounting screw holes, so the, that's what those will be as well. To keep that separate so we don't mix up. So there's probably no point in undoing these because they won't actually change anything. The form factor of this Panasonic monitor seems to be the nicest because it's more like something you'd have for field use where it's very compact, you can easily mount it into some rig so it's easily viewable by whoever needs to see it. Whereas these, the Kigami and the Sony one, are more the type that you'd install somewhere in your video wall. In your control room or your van. Presumably we do these screws at the side. I'm not sure whether we'll have to undo those. 
but see things like those connectors and that will have to come with the panel because they're secured from the other side. I think these are retained screws. Yes, that's nice. There's no fans in this, but it's got pretty significant heat sinking all around. Does this open now? Might be have a gasket in there. Or oh, it might be waiting for me to undo these screws. Let's see if we loosen up these. I'm also wondering, do I need to take those brackets off? Maybe it's those? Could those be holding something down? Let's look under there, see what's what's doing. I reckon we're gonna have to take these brackets off. I think that's what's going on here. Got this the other day. It's a screwdriver tool set that the driver pops out of there and then it's got a whole bunch of those things so presumably there'll be one that's the right size for that well, there you go, first go and it's got quite a nice feeling aluminum handle yeah but these are a bit tight for it though like no grip on that nope who are they? I don't think that changed anything Okay, did that make it come off? Uh, it might have changed something. I think that what's happening is there's a connector somewhere between the two halves. Yeah. Is that... no. It's heat sinking between the two halves. Wow, look at that. Okay, so we didn't need to loosen any of that back panel stuff. Ah, so there's thermal coupling with some heat sink strips. In a bunch of places. None there for some reason. Ah, oh, I see. Okay, so that chip there, genin, and there's some really thin coaxes, koai, going from there over to here. That will be the SDI board. Yeah. So that genin chip will be dealing with the SDI signals and it's probably similar to that one there you see there's a little oscillator type thing next to it that thing there and there's similarly one there so I think this is an option board to add SDI to the monitor hopefully we're not wrecking that ribbon cable there's collectors under it there's the connection to the panel oh look there's some big guy under there you can see the bypassing and all the... Oh, there's some dip switches. Was that what that cover went to? Oh, that long one there uncovers a connector for some reason. I think we'll just put these screws back together. Yeah, so we didn't have to undo these brackets. There was no point in doing that. We didn't have to undo these little screws here either. And we didn't have to take off that panel. Let's take it apart further so that we can see what panel is in this. And I want to see, is it the same as in the Ikigami monitor? Now what should we do to get further in? So those wires there will be for the switching of the SDI signal. Probably a relay on there. It switches which one you're using and then routes that one to the output as well. Okay, this has the thing I've seen in Panasonic video cameras where there's a little button. There's a pin in the XLR connector for the 12 volts and it pushes on the switch here to switch between the battery and the DC input. This backlight inverter board looks very similar to the one that's in this here, right here. Guess we should should we uncover it? Boom, there's the all sealed up and stuff. Now, interesting they've got some pins cut off on the connector there, whereas this one it's all wired, but it does look like a very similar connector. The high voltage connections are on each end, which is the same. And it's in a plastic housing thing, which looks more or less the same. Yeah, look at that. It's got the same looking warning labels, too. Let me rip that open. I reckon that is the same thing. It seems to have a part number visible anywhere. But yeah, I reckon that's the same backlight inverter board. 
shared between the monitors. See if we can undo all of this. Oh, that with a tally light. Well, can this all come off as one sheet? I think it can. I don't think we need to undo the, the board from the heat sink plate. But we do want to see what that chip is. Uh, but we don't want to wreck the cable. An interesting clamp there, which seems to be also grounding it. And we'll have to undo that. And we'll have to undo this. Okay, now this should hinge up and leave the high voltage wires connected. Or should we hinge it the other way and disconnect the high voltage wires? I think that might be easier because that there is not want to budge. Let's just disconnect everything. Now I'm going to put these back in though. Oh, look at this, we've got another NEC panel. Okay, is it the same? It is the same. You know, 10276BC16-01. It's the same thing. This is a year newer, almost. That's 2007, 12th month, 7th day. This was 2006, 5th month. So, well, half a year newer. That's interesting. That didn't answer what we wanted, which we wanted a panel that we could stick in the Sony monitor to try out solving the problem, but instead we discovered these two share. So that would make me think quite highly. It's quite likely then that the Sony version with the SDI and the HD capable would have the same panel again. It's probably just the industry standard thing that gets used in this 8.4 inch professional monitors. So the last thing we want to do is get this board off and have a look what chip is on the other side of it without destroying everything. We're just going to hinge it up a little bit and look at it. Surprisingly not much pushing down in that area. It's only got screws holding it down in the corners. So I guess it's not squished onto a heatsink particularly hard. Not squished particularly hard onto a heatsink. Maybe it's glued on. Could be. Oh no. Not glued on. And there's another chip there. Which is also attached. Oh, and a third. Okay, there's lots of chips. Whoa, okay, way more than just three. <laughs> that, so there was four. Look at all the stuff that's in this. This is a bit more like the Ikigami monitor now, isn't it? There's a Panasonic guy there. That looks as big as that Hitachi thing. Almost. Maybe it's doing a similar job. Oh, look at that. And there's an Altera Cyclone there and there. And there's a Sony chip there. Where's the panel? The panel is there. Okay, so this looks like it's doing a pretty similar thing to what the, what the Ikigami monitor has. With the signal inputs down here, two cyclones, some other hardcore processor thing, and then the panel comes out there, panel data. So I'm not sure, that might just be a CPU. It might not be in the signal path like that huge thing in the Ikigami monitor. Also, that looks quite CPU like. There's that little switch in the connector, the small button in the back there. Interesting. Power supply is there. Another little regulated doofy. So there's lots of stuff doing this. Okay. All right, so that board there is a composite video decoder. That's the composite signal coming over. That's an NXP chip, SAA7115. And then that one there is the SDI decoder. So that must be turning the composite into digital. This has uh, component inputs, doesn't it? Component and RGB. Not sure where those get converted. Maybe that happens in that Sony thing. It's possible. Oh yeah, it looks like it. It's definitely in that Sony thing there. Because there's test points for it right there. Let's say P, R, P, B, and Y. So yeah, that's digitizing the component stuff. Very well. Alright, we're going to put all this stuff back together now. So in terms of design, the Sony one seems to be the worst. It's just boards flapping everywhere with plates and brackets and things that don't really make sense especially that fan one whereas these Ikigami and the Panasonic ones they seem to be quite a bit more logical 
And there's this clamshell thing. Just this less layers of boards to go through. Dunno, they're fairly similar really in terms of design difficulty or ease or whateverness. Anyway, I think the Sony one was a little bit more rough with the way that two back panel boards and then all those cable assemblies which didn't seem to be quite long enough all twisted together. It's interesting that the composite decoding is on a little module. You'd think that would be a standard option, like who like I don't know, is that you can get a version that doesn't have composite input? I suppose. A lot of places these days would just want the SDI and nothing else. Don't know how much money it would save by not having the composite. Luckily this one seems to be fully specced out so we can see all the stuff. And I've got a camera that outputs SDI and also some adapter things so you can turn SDI into HDMI and back again. Now these... Oh, you can't even see what's going on here. Anyway, I'm plugging in these wires and then there are these little loop hooky thingies which just hold the wires securely a little bit but not really. Okay, should we do this a smoke test just to make sure we haven't wrecked it before we put the case back together? I don't know if we need to pull those off. Probably do need to pull that off. Because we want to see what is under there. What are those connectors? Oh, look at that. They're just little SMA type doofies. There's also an LED on there, which is interesting. Maybe we should put an SDI signal into this and see what it does. Well, the light will come on, presumably. Got an SDI signal right here with this camera. SDI output. Should we put a different lens on it so that we can get something? This is a microscope lens. Yeah, there's also this guy which you can then get HDMI off your computer or some other camera and then turns it into SDI. And then there's this one which does goes the other way. It takes the SDI and turns that into HDMI. Get a little lens here for this camera. So this is a camera will output a plastic lens mount, that's a bit budget. It's not a particularly high quality lens then I guess. It says Tamron on it, but I think it's just some rebadged cheap stuff though. Anyway, it's got the audio iris connector so that's nice. It does just a 12 volt input and then yeah, HD SDI output you can do it to 1080 30p or 1080 60i. Best way to power that sort of little things that need 12 volts, you get a USB-C PD trigger cable, 12 volt output, and that just goes to a barrel. So you just plug that into your standard PD charger, and then you can power up stuff. Now, if you want to see the monitor do something, you plug that into the SDI input. Input one. And we get the 12 volt cable over here. Uh, probably need the control panel on it, don't we? Because we haven't got. Uh, well, I don't know if it's auto selecting. So we'll just wire that control panel up. Yes, yeah, so the control panel wires go to that. That's the other side of the connector. Goes onto there. Switch on. See the backlight is on. No signal, so let's push input SDI. Yes, it came up. It appears to be all good. Ah, look at that. The, there's an orange light and a green light on that board. So push input. Okay, the green light's gone because now it must be on SDI 2 if we switch that over. Yep, there you go, look at that, it syncs up. That orange one's probably just power. Oh, yeah, if you're not using an SDI input, it goes off. All right, very good. So I think we haven't wrecked this monitor, which is quite pleased about that, because it wasn't cheap and it's quite a useful monitor. Yeah, so SDI one, 1080p. We've got this little camera hooked up here, and we can have a gander at stuff with this little camera. Look at that, that's the speaker. 8 ohms, 1 watt. That would be pumping. The mystery Hitachi chip. Anyway, there you go. That's the monitor. And if we plug this other cable in, get that over here. That's a big one. It's just dragging everything with it. We put that into the composite input. 
And we push the input selection button. SDI 2, video, there you go, back to the bars. Awesome, so we haven't wrecked this monitor, that's good to know. Let's switch that off and we can finish putting it back together. Now the cables are twisted together. Yeah, this thing here looks like it's on its last legs. Looks like someone's tried to heat shrink over the connector and the heat shrink's unfortunately folded under. Yeah, so I'm thinking, should I peel that off? Cut off the heat shrink? Or will I find something really dodgy? It's like one of those CB radio microphone connectors that's got the external clamp on it. If anyone knows what a CB radio is these days. Except it's like a high out multi-pin thing. Okay, well let's put that back together. There aren't any extra screws remaining. The only thing is these brackets, but I can put those back on later. Uh, the four screws there are those four screws that we pulled off of these mounting holes, which don't actually go to... they're just there for you mounting the monitor on things. I'm not going to bother putting back the Sony monitor at this stage because, well, it doesn't work. So I'll think about that if there's anything we can measure. Perhaps try and find a service manual and see is there anything that we can measure to determine what its problem is. And I might also keep a lookout for a uh, one of the SDI versions and then perhaps we can do a comparison between that and the other one and these and see if there's anything interesting in there. Not sure, should I put these back on or clean them first? I wonder where the dust and grit inside the monitor got in. It seems pretty well sealed. Yeah, so this must be really good for field work because it's such a sealed up design compared to the other ones, so I'm not going to get filled up with dust and grit from being outside. Yeah, because this battery mount, when I took that off, it had a, a rubber gasket thing around it as well. Keep dust out because that has a path there to the inside of the monitor. Yeah, so to get those connectors through, there's a a plastic sheet along there which will come off and then this little path so the wires will go into there and then the connectors can fit through cunning little thing okay nice Panasonic monitor now let's get this thing back together let's see the nice little backlight doofy it's a I guess the, the backlight driver board is comes with the panel well not necessarily with it but they get purchased together as a compatible set so the wires coming out of the panel with the backlight for well, the backlight has got the right plug on it plug into this board so it'll be, it comes as a set that goes together yeah, better job of reading the part number off that thermal pad than you do off the chip itself i suppose that's clever in a way because the pressure from this chip pushing on to the aluminium is pushing the aluminium onto the chip below from a thermal point of view it's not ideal because it means you've got two sources of heat on each side of the same heatsink. I guess they're not pumping out too much. It's that Genium, the SDI chip, which needs the heat sinking. I guess the one on the Panasonic monitor doesn't need heat sinking. Unless there was something on the other side of the board. Okay, this goes in. Do we need to look in the power supply there? Not really. Not quite as complicated as that Sony one, but and it off the shelf switch mode. Okay, that's everything that's inside. You can see there, there that audio input connector. You see a speaker here, yeah, that's the speaker wire there. And there's just a little, pretty much class D kind of audio amplifier thing on the back there. Nothing too exciting. This is ready to go back together. Let's give this a little test. Join up the SDI and we'll join up the bars. Composite bars. Put a terminator on there. We haven't secured the BNC connectors yet, so we'd be careful. These huge thick cables going onto it. And the power. Let's see. Oh, the power switch is already on. With the fan spin up. There's the bars. So that's all good. And there's the SDI. With this camera, there's the computer mouse. It's got a ball, of course, like all good mouse should. Great!
uh, that's a look inside some professional video monitors. LCD monitors, of course. None of that CRT nonsense. Ah, what we need to do is check the performance of gaming, don't we? See if these rival the CRTs for gaming monitors. Have you noticed now every advert for someone on eBay or wherever selling an old TV is now called a gaming monitor? <laughs> Pretty funny. Not just some random crusty old CRT anymore that they're throwing out. It's now a gaming monitor. And because of that it costs hundreds. A few years ago you couldn't give them away. And now people are climbing all over them. CRTs that is. I don't know about these type of video, uh, LCD video monitors. So these two Ikigami monitors go in into a bracket thing and then they rack mount side by side. It's pretty nice. Oh uh, yeah, real good GIS, look at that. <laughs> now there's one plastic type screw there which goes into that RCA connector. And then there's three into the BNC connectors. Very good, there's your monitors. Alright, let's try it. I've got this thing. I don't know if this counts as retro gaming because from my point of view this thing's pretty modern. But Let's try it anyway. This is one of the latest gaming things, isn't it? It's got the best game in it. God, like a mint condition controller. Super tangled up wire. Kids these days won't even know what this thing is. I've got this. Oh. Yeah, we're not going to be able to do this, unfortunately, because it, uh, I only have this output thing and I thought, I remember I bodged it a really long time ago come from my brother, it wasn't mine, but back then I bodged out an audio connection but what I remembered, I thought it was a video output so I thought we could use that, but this has got a TV thing because uh, so, I don't know, if we want to do this we either need to get out a VCR PAL VCR and decode the video signal. Or we gotta take this apart and see if we can find the composite output signal. Did PlayStation have component or RGB? I've got whatever that is. I don't know, this might be a bit of a waste of time. I'm pretty sure this thing doesn't even work properly. Looks like people have been in there before. <laughs> well, obviously I have been in there. Probably more than 20 years ago. Or about 20 years ago. When would this have existed? Pretty sure we didn't get this new and it was in something like 99 or 2000 that got this PlayStation. I suppose that is more than 20 years ago, isn't it? Okay. So this only brings one channel of audio through. That's pretty disgusting. That's why we only wired one out of it because it used to go into another audio system for better sound because the Pretty weak CRT TV that we had. Yeah, it didn't provide the best sound. So all we gotta do is switch that. So that must be a terminating resistor there for the video signal. What a crusty thing. Alright, let's turn on the soldering iron and we'll just shift that over and then we'll have a video out instead of an audio out. And yeah, the problem is it's terminated on there. So well, we'll just not connect the terminator on this monitor and then, then it'll be fine, I guess. There you go, we've now got a video out. Good old composite video out. I don't know why I don't have the actual proper AV output cable, but I don't think this came with it. It wasn't new and yeah that's just what it had it was cheap someone else has already lost it and wrecked it but back then hardly any tvs had an av connection anyway so well none of the ones that we had access to let's try it i'm going to join this onto the video in channel one let me find the power from wherever that went hook up the power to this monitor yeah, that's one issue with these monitors, isn't it? They're hard to see with this up-in-the-air camera system. 
right, uh, what are we on here? Analog channel A. Let's juice this up. I think this has got that spring in it, it does, so that you can use the mod chip stuff and have it open. Oh, well, look at that. We're not gonna, going to get any sound because it's, um... Yeah, we don't have any sound connection. We just wrecked the sound connection that we had. And I don't think this is going to load the disc because it's pooped, basically. I wonder if we add the Terminator, will that, what will that do to the video? Oh, okay, so it wasn't actually terminated that well. Because, yeah, that the colour's washed out there, but that brings it back to sort of normal. Maybe it is a little bit bright. But, yeah. What you have to do is have this thing up on a up on its edge. Remember the noise that made when it comes up? Oh, it might be going. Look at that. Look at this. We get to play a game. No sound. Maybe we should have got a TV out so we can tune that in and get the sound. It's having a bit of trouble reading though. The laser's gone weak. It was never the best in the first place. Can't remember the cheats that were in the manual, so you can get infinity whatever it is and no police, and then you can just take a ride as hard out as you want. Oh, they changed 480 and oh there's the intro video. I can't play it because I'm holding the monitor up with my hand. Take a ride. San Francisco, of course. Day, of course. Let's go. Go out of those sweet jumps, the steep streets. Yeah, so this is a perfect gaming monitor. We don't need a CRT after all. Oh, the police are there. Wow, you don't have to steer very much. Uh, what's the handbrake button? There we go. Let's take off down here. Gotta watch out for the trams. I wonder if YouTube will get upset about the driver logo or something. Like it got upset about the laser discs, even obscure ones that we played in the other video. What a hassle. We'll see what happens. What I need to do is get a faster computer so when YouTube does have a problem with it, I can quickly re render out the video again after blacking off some things and get it uploaded again instead of waiting hours for it to re-render at least the uploading part is fast with really decent internet these days oh it doesn't have scan lines is that what people will be upset about oops Well, it looks like it does, doesn't it? Not really. Through the camera it looks like it does, but in real life it's just a nice, smooth, clear picture. Playing like this, with one finger holding the accelerator, <laughs> and the other finger steering. Uh, that was the wrong move, wasn't it? Oh well. You've wrecked your car. Oh, what? It stopped! Oh, well, I guess that's it then. Yep, so that was professional video monitors. Should we just check the other one now? Since we've got come this far, let's try the Panasonic one.
just for fun, since we're here. Oh, we gotta have the the we can't because it doesn't have the control panel connected. I guess that is one limitation of having that external control panel is that it's easy to not have it there and then you don't get to control what you want to control. Okay, so the picture looks fine. So it's fine. It's mint. No, it's NTSC, is it? Really? No. Looks like it's set on underscan, doesn't it? Or maybe that's just what PlayStations do. You can see the logo in the waveform. Mm, camera doesn't like this one, does it? Yeah, I'm not really prepared to wait for this to load up again for not really much benefit, so... Hopefully that was an exciting look at three different professional video monitors of the LCD variety. LCD Persuasion 8.4 inch LCD professional video monitors and a PlayStation. Until next time.